Okay, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about the dementia turning point, and we're gonna talk a lot about this book right here. It's called Alzheimer's Turning Point. The author's name is Jack Delatore, PhD. This is the best book ever written on the subject of dementia. Um, I called the lecture, though, Dementia Turning Point. I really don't even like the word Alzheimer's. I think it confuses people. It's sort of a wastebasket diagnosis. Oh, person is demented, they've got Alzheimer's. And then you, everybody hears, oh, well, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. You know what? That's actually a controversial statement. I'm not even sure this conventional idea of Alzheimer's even exists, as we'll talk about in this lecture. And one of the things this lecture is going to make clear, by far, what seems to me, a, a brain expert who studied this for decades, the most common cause of dementia is problems with blood flow to the brain. Okay? There's obviously more to it than that. It's multifactorial. One of the things that... Um, Delatory. I actually figured out the brain was primarily shrinking due to apoptosis because it's obvious. There's nothing on the brain MRI. There is no stroke most of the time. It's just the brain creep shrinking. Um, so that's because they're losing neurons. You don't see anything on a brain MRI when the brain goes into program cell death through apoptosis, meaning that it recycles itself so that it's just absorbed and there is no inflammatory response. When there's a stroke, it's obvious. Blood vessels blocked, a bunch of brain tissue dies microglia, macrophage-like cells come in to reabsorb it. There's edema all over the place. You can point right to it and specify the exact gyrus that's involved. With the, whereas with apoptosis, there's just diffuse, progressive shrinkage of the brain. That's what I actually see all day long every day. Okay, so what did Delatore do that was so magnificent? Well, his research was tying the artery, the carotid artery. It's the main artery that goes up to the brain. There's one on each side. He would tie off the carotid artery in the neck, internal carotid, common carotid. Okay, and then he'd see what happened. And typically the mice, especially the older mice, would become demented a couple of months later. And that's very interesting. And it provided a model to understand dementia. So basically, when they did autopsies on these mice several months later, there was no stroke. There was no stroke. No sudden occlusion of a vessel causing the brain cells to die. There was just a gradual loss of brain cells through apoptosis, programmed cell death with brain shrinkage like what I see every day. Okay, um, and then once you say, okay, well that doesn't really happen in real life, an artery doesn't get tied off. Well, as a matter of fact, it kind of does. Okay, Com carotid artery stenosis, meaning that narrowing of the carotid artery due to atherosclerosis, super common, okay? Um, and then you start saying, well, what else could lower blood supply to the brain? If you ask a neurologist, what are the three most common causes of stroke? One of them will say atrial fibrillation. So that's when you have an arrhythmia of the heart so that it can't pump in a coordinated fashion and it'll form blood clots within something called the left atrial appendage and it can toss one up to the brain and cause a, a stroke. When people think, you ask any doctor, any doctor you walk up to, you say, Does they, how does AFib cause a stroke? They'll say it forms a clot in left atrial appendage, embolized, that means it moves up to the brain, causes a stroke. But guess what? The main way AFib causes brain damage is because you lose approximately 25% of left ventricular filling due to uncoordinated contractions of the atrium so that you get less blood going to the brain on a chronic basis, especially when the rates are too fast, for example, even less time to allow for ventricular filling. So chronic underperfusion of the brain, it's a mouse equivalent, congestive heart failure, typically due to atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries causing ischemia, lack of blood supply to the heart, can't pump enough blood to the brain, mouse equivalent. Dementia, okay? Sleep apnea. These patients, um, they put a pulse ox on their finger. They check their pulse oxygen saturation overnight. They're dropping their sats, quite a few of them, um, quite a bit. I've seen guys in their 30s dropping their sats down into the 60s. Um, you don't get enough oxygen to your brain, you start losing brain cells. Diabetics, they used to just, you know, stick their finger about two, three times in the day but they had no idea where they were at night. Nowadays, they put these continuous glucose monitors on their abdomen. It's checking their blood glucose level, let's say every 15 minutes, they get a printout. They're dropping their blood glucose levels into the 50s. Normally should be, you know, like 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so they are uh, hypoglycemic, uh, decreased glucose delivery to those brain cells overnight. Low blood sugar is more dangerous than high blood sugar, okay? Same thing with uh, hypertension. Low blood pressure, excessively low blood pressure, symptomatic low blood pressure is worse than high blood pressure, okay, in the sense that you drop oxygen delivery to the brain. And that's overtreated uh, hypertension when they're taking too many uh, drugs that treat them too much and lower their blood pressure too much, is what I'm talking about. It's good to have a relatively low blood pressure when you're not taking any pills and you feel good, okay? 
like a person who's born in a population where they don't add any salt to the food and they eat a plant-based diet, they'll keep, they'll keep the same baby blood pressure, which is about 95 over 60 their whole life. You know, they might go up a little bit to about 110 over 70, but they're still doing great into their 70s and 80s. All right. Carotid stenosis, we talked about that. Aortic stenosis. So the aortic valve is the outflow of the heart. When that is narrowed, stenotic means narrowed, or when it's regurgitant, that means that it's, it's leaking back inward, leaking backwards, that will decrease blood supply to the brain, mouse equivalent, okay? So now you're seeing how this is becoming real common. Tons of things are causing decreased blood supply to the brain. All right, post-cabbage hypotension. You know, I was in the operating room. I wasn't in the operating room. I stayed with my father in the intensive care unit. He had open heart surgery. That was many, many years ago, and I didn't know enough. I told him to go vegetarian. I'd heard of the Ornish diet, but, you know, I didn't know enough to, like, insist upon it. And he's, he was told by his cardiologist, oh, you need a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft. And so my dad went through that, and he actually came out of it reasonably well. He was 74 at the time of the operation. And, you know, he probably had clean carotids, but here's what was interesting about it. They ran his post-op blood pressure, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, really low. Um, I forget the exact number, in the ballpark of like, um, you know, 80, 90, 85 to 90 systolic over about 60, 65, and I couldn't believe how low it was. I kept asking the anesthesiologist, why are you doing that? And he goes, well, we don't want him to bleed out as anastomosis. That's the connection point of the arterial grafts on the heart. And like I said, my dad tolerated it well, but I'm sure a lot of patients with more baseline cerebral atherosclerosis or cervical atherosis don't come out of that so well. And there's something called pump head, meaning that cognitive decline uh, post-operative after being on the bypass pump. Uh, severe anemia is fine, things that increase demand. Okay, we can get into details later. We're gonna talk about a lot of this stuff uh, in more detail in a more theoretical way here in just a moment. And the reason I'm going through this is because I think it's good for a person to understand why they have a disease or what causes a disease. And it's good to have a correct understanding because your theory, your understanding of what a disease does and what causes it is how you decide to prevent it. And if you don't understand how what causes it, then you don't know what to avoid. And if you just say Alzheimer's is genetic or it's aging or it's bad luck, then there's not much you could do. But once you understand it's primarily a vascular disease, then it's easy to avoid the things that cause vascular disease. There are other things that cause cognitive impairment and most of them can be avoided. Not all of them can be completely avoided, but by limiting it to the ones that are unavoidable and then optimizing everything else, you got good odds to do fantastic. And there's plenty of centenarians, 105 years old, they're perfectly intact with their brains and their physical part of their body. So, okay. Um, so Delatory describes cerebral vascular dementia as being primarily due to a lack of blood flow, chronic brain hypoperfusion. The old theory of the beta amyloid cascade is not really well understood, it seems, by anyone. There's many different theories of how it works. Um, and what I'm basically saying is I think that the beta amyloid plaques come primarily after most of the disease. Now, don't get me wrong. I do think there is a component of it that's real and does cause some disease, but it's just not the prime mover of the process. We'll talk about it more later in this lecture and in other lectures, and there are some interesting concepts about it, okay? But also, like I said, getting back to disease theory, be careful when somebody says a disease is idiopathic. The joke is that that means that the doctor's an idiot and the patient's pathetic. So idiopathic means of unknown cause. Be careful when you're told that a disease is genetic because that implies there's nothing you can do. A lot of times there's a genetic vulnerability, but that doesn't mean that they're causative. So just because somebody has a positive family history of dementia or diabetes or heart disease, they don't have to get heart disease at all. The incidence of heart disease is zero out of many thousands of persons in populations where they eat a plant-based diet, okay? Um, and also, once you go down the path of its unknown cause and its genetic, there's a tendency to just say, just take this pill and forget about it, okay? And I've noticed a lot of people will take a pill, even when it's proven that the pill has no benefit in that situation. So just remember, you always want optimal results, optimal care. You don't want to accept standard of care if you haven't at first checked that there might be something better than that, optimal care. The reason why optimal is not always the so-called standard is because the vast majority of patients aren't willing to do anything. A lot of them are demented, confused, uncooperative. And so take a pill is something anyone could do. You could give a pill to a dog, okay? But 
it's very small, the percentage of people that are willing to change their diet. It's very small, the percentage of people that are willing to exercise. Um, so that's why so-called optimal results, they only come from individuals that are motivated and want to become informed about their condition, which is a surprisingly small number of persons. But of course, the audience for these videos, that's what you're here for, to get the good stuff. Okay, another thing too, people ask me questions. Should I go for a coronary artery calcium CAT scan? No, stupid. Why is it stupid? Because if you've eaten the SAD diet before in your life, I guarantee you, you got coronary artery disease. I guarantee it. You don't need to check. You know it's there. All right. So why radiate yourself? You know how much radiation is it? I don't know the exact amount. I've read different things. I'm not even going to say them. But you don't want any radiation if you don't need it to your chest for no reason. Okay. If you already had one, it's not that big of a deal. I don't think it's going to probably cause you any problems. But I wouldn't go looking for more radiation that you don't need. Um, and so what? It's not going to get you to do anything different if you understand what's going on. You know you've got atherosclerosis, so eat in a way that prevents atherosclerosis and even enables you to reverse the component that could be reversed. I looked at you know, thousands of demented brains and 95% of them have diabetes or hypertension or both. So what you want to do to minimize dementia? Avoid diabetes and high blood pressure. They're both causes of vascular disease. And you know the routine. Low fat, low sodium, whole food, 100% vegan, 100% organic diet. Okay, now we're going to get into some more of the interesting stuff here. Okay, so I actually figured out on my own, independent of deletority years ago, that the brain was shrinking due to apoptosis. I even wrote a book about that. But I've, I've learned a ton of stuff about the brain since then. So that's not like my proudest moment, that book. That was more like I wanted to crank a book out real fast to prove that I had figured it out. But I hadn't really figured out all the details in a more sophisticated way. All right, so anyways, uh, like I said, disease theories are a big deal because they understand what you can do and what's possible and what to expect. Okay, um, so we talked about some of these things. You can minimize your exposure to aluminum, all these other risk factors. Exercise and you sweat out some of the toxins. It also causes neurogenesis, which means building new neurons. Um, you can build cognitive reserve. That comes out of the NUN study. A bunch of nuns in Mankato, Minnesota at the Notre Dame convent donated their brains to science after their death. And what they found was the ones that were more studious, that liked to read a lot, write a lot, teach a lot, they were much less likely to have Alzheimer's, even if they had extensive um, you know, beta amyloid plaques in their brain and whatnot. So we'll talk about that some other time, but just letting you know this concept of cognitive reserve. Um, Optimize your sleep. The brain cleans itself at night with the glymphatic system. So you help your brain keep up with uh, clearing out its waste products when you get adequate sleep. When you improve your social skills as good as you can, you minimize unnecessary stress, you just get along with people, having a personal philosophy and worldview that helps you to you know, reach your potential as an individual socially, intellectually, and in whatever other way is important to you. And like I said, there's good reason to be hopeful. Lots of people in these centenarian study ones by Buechner and National Geographic and by other authors in their 90s and 100s with good brain function doing well. All right. I've noticed that in my lectures. I have to do this initial introductory stuff before we get to the really good stuff. Just have to do it. Otherwise, the good stuff wouldn't be understandable. Okay. Why is I use JT as initials for Jack Delatory? Jack Torrey, um, why are we so sure about the vascular hypothesis? Because when you look at brains, the vascular hypothesis makes sense of everything versus these other theories, you're like, what is that? Like I said, when I look at the brains, I don't see focal, isolated, predominant atrophy in the medial temporal lobe, the so-called characteristic pattern of Alzheimer's. I just don't see it, hardly ever. Um, uh, also, Alberto Espe, he's a real smart guy. He especially writes about uh, Parkinson's disease. He wrote a very nice book called Brain Fables. Francisco Gonzalez Lima, he's a guy who did research with uh, Jack Del Torre. Um, and there's others. You'll see. If you start studying it, you'll see things point towards the vascular hypothesis being correct. Everything I've ever seen about it is correct. Um, whereas everything I've seen clinically about beta amyloid makes me not believe it, all right, for good reasons. Um, and in the words of Francisco Gonzalez Lima, PhD, the beta amyloid theory is essentially irrelevant to uh, the chronic typical uh, dementia. 
There is such a thing. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay, so why do we say that? The senile plaques are formed by beta amyloid. And those are extracellular. Think of those as being extracellular. Beta amyloid uh, plaques. The hyperphosphorylated tau protein is what leads to, you know, from the microtubules. This is inside the cell, intracellular. And this forms neurofibrillary tangles. So senile plaques are abbreviated SPs. Neurofibrillary tangles are abbreviated NFTs. They are not unique to Alzheimer's. And they're not even just not unique to Alzheimer's. You see them all the time in a normal person. The older the person, you're going to see more of them in 100% complete cognitively normal people. Some people will say that they exaggerate the importance of cognitive reserve because otherwise it would totally disprove their theory. So be that as it may, you see senile plaques, neurofibrillate tangles in your vascular dementia patients. You see them in your Parkinson's patient, patients. They're not definitive for Alzheimer's. And that's the point I'm saying is, is Alzheimer's even really a real disease when you can't diagnose it that well at autopsy? You know, if you're seeing the same thing in a normal person as in an Alzheimer's patient without a clinical history, how does the person examining the brain know they're looking at Alzheimer's versus a normal person? I'm not so sure they do. Okay? So the autopsy diagnosis of Alzheimer's is largely overrated and largely bogus. All right. Well, what about an MRI? I just told you, I can't diagnose Alzheimer's on any type of routine basis on MRI. So the MRI diagnosis is invalid, all right? So the brain autopsy diagnosis is invalid and the MRI diagnosis is not clinically useful. So how do you know that the disease even exists? You can make a clinical category, but you know you can't really diagnose it clinically. That's been pretty well shown. So if you can't diagnose it clinically, you can't diagnose it by MRI, you can't diagnose it um, at autopsy. You can do a nuclear medicine test to check for amyloid, but guess what? That can also be positive in a normal person, so that's not that useful either. And if there's no way to diagnose it, is it real? Okay. Now, there is such a thing as familial Alzheimer's. Now, that's relatively uncommon. Maybe about 4% of patients, typically occurring at a younger age, you know, let's say from 40 to 60 years of age. It's also true that Down syndrome patients, they have trisomy 21. That means three copies of chromosome 21. They get a lot more Alzheimer's. The gene for the amyloid precursor protein associated with the whole amyloid cascade hypothesis is located on chromosome 21. And overproduction of amyloid precursor protein is part of the process of Down syndrome patients having increased incidence of Alzheimer's. These are relatively rare things. So what I'm basically saying is familiar Alzheimer's is a rare disease. It is associated with amyloid protein and amyloid plaques, but that's an uncommon special situation versus the so-called generic form of dementia is super common. So early onset familial Alzheimer's is also associated with mutations. PS1 and PS2, those are just presenilins. You know, look at that name, presenile, presenile 1, presenile 2. And then APP is amyloid precursor protein. You're going to hear these words, so it's good to know their names if you start reading about Alzheimer's. The, the Dr. Alzheimer's, you know, the index patient who died at 51 years of age with dementia, you know, likely had familial Alzheimer's, not the sporadic. Sporadic means not attributable to any clear-cut genetic uh, cause. And um, most of Alzheimer's patients are the late onset or sporadic type, non-genetic type, and they're usually over 60 years of age. And what I'm saying is they're not the same disease. Familial Alzheimer's is this genetic, relatively specific disease that is related to amyloid. Um, but it's, a, it's not true that the sporadic generalized dementia is due to the same thing. It's not for the reasons we just talked about. Okay, The focal accumulations, let's say a senile plaques, they don't correlate well with cognitive impairment. You don't find them especially... For example, in the basal nucleus of minor, the key site of early neuronal loss in dementia. Um, the amyloid precursor protein is something, like I said, that's normally found in everyone's brain. Um, some accumulation of these plaques is part of getting old. So what I'm saying is, in the context of a typical aging-related vascular dementia, these senile plaques are more like tombstones. You know, a, a tombstone doesn't mean the tombstone killed the person. It just is a marker of where the dead person's buried. And so that appears to be the correct, the most accurate perspective on uh, senile plaques. And in terms of understanding brain function, this is wonderful news. This is great news. You can't prevent some 
100% genetic disease. You can't prevent some vague, weird amyloid cascade thing. Who the heck knows for sure what's the correct mechanism of it? Now, don't get me wrong. There's more to amyloid than that, and I'll talk about that in a future lecture. But what I'm just trying to say, it's not the money. It's not the main thing. So a couple quick points are that with aging, blood supply to the brain gets decreased. The lining cells of the arteries, those are the endothelial cells, they make less nitric oxide as a person gets older, especially if they eat a lousy diet. Persons who eat a healthy diet, they maintain better endothelial function than others. You have less endothelial precursor cells. Those are stem cells to make fix endothelium when there's an injury or to reabsorb an atherosclerotic plaque. There's more loss of wind kessel, means stiffening of the ascending aorta, uh, so less diastolic flow. There's more small vessel arterial wall stiffening, usually from chronic hypertension and atherosclerosis. Um, not so much, though, if a person lives a healthy lifestyle. For example, you don't get it in the populations that eat, have no, don't add salt and eat a low-fat diet. They don't get atherosclerosis. Okay. Um, so like we said, uh, deletories, vascular hypothesis, a dementia says that Reduced blood flow is the main cause. And where does it first start? You mostly see it in the hippocampus initially, and that's a big deal. Hippocampal neurons are the main part of your memory center, the medial temporal lobe. So when you lose those neurons, your memory is not going to be good. And how do you remember anything? You associate with what you already know. So it has to connect that information somehow to your existing scaffold of knowledge, the library of facts and events and memories in your brain. Okay, that's why brain cells don't turn over. They don't die. Uh, under normal conditions because they have to keep your memories for your entire life. But that also puts them at risk to accumulate toxic things like aluminum, for example. Um, and like I said, when they did autopsies on his rodents that had had their carotid arteries or their other arteries tied off, they didn't have strokes. They just had apoptosis. Um, but like I said, the wonderful great news out of all this is vascular disease is easy to prevent. And, you know, I'm only talking to people that want to learn and want to help themselves. You're going to run into all kinds of people. I'd rather die than stop eating meat. Well, fine. That's actually what happens. Basically, if you don't become plant-based after 50, you're pretty much screwed for your health. You're going to end up on a bunch of pills or you're going to end up with surgeries, most likely both. It's basically amongst the average American that I know, it's just normal to be fat and sick and hypertensive and pre-diabetic or diabetic after 50 and then to go for open heart surgery, cataract surgery and all this other stuff, hip replacements, knee replacements. You know what? Vegans don't get any of that stuff. So to me, it's pretty much of a, it's an obvious smart choice. I'll eat the optimal diet, I'll get my exercise and I won't have to take any pills. I won't have to go for any surgeries. You don't necessarily, these centenarians in these other countries, they don't take any pills. They don't go for any surgeries. Zero, none. That's partly why I think the low fat, low sodium vegan diet doesn't get popularized because there's no money in it. Nobody makes money off a skinny, healthy vegan. I'm 58, I take zero meds, zero pills. I don't even, even go to a doctor. You don't need to go to a doctor if you're healthy, okay? Okay, that's so why I said, here's this motto, vegan today, vegan tomorrow, vegan forever. All right, so anyways, we're going to go through a little more of how this all works. Talked about this before, but just briefly, you know, a person gets fat, there's a tendency to also get obstructive sleep apnea, and I talked about them dropping their sats at night. Talked about the diabetics dropping their sugars at night. Not good. Okay, just a couple of loose ends before we get to one more summary slide that you're going to like. Uh, the cholinergic hypothesis of Alzheimer's, it's been refuted. ATP is Alzheimer turning point. That's Delatory's book. So again, that's the book we just talked about earlier. And um, I just gave you a page number. If you want to read more about these, if you're curious, because some people take medicines for cholinergic hypothesis, but I think that's, in my opinion, not a smart choice. I wouldn't do it. Aluminum contributes to cognitive decline but it's not the primary cause. You, you do certainly want to avoid aluminum as best you can, but I don't think it's the driving force overall. But I do think, yeah, I do think it's a major brain neurotoxin. Um, the main brain finding, as we spoke about, is atrophy. Um, and also, in other, in other things in my experience looking at brains, I see atrophy all the time, all day, every day. Almost all the patients are hypertensive or diabetic or both. Most of the time, they're both. Like in 90%, they're both. Uh, the vast majority of memory loss patients, when I look at a CAT scan of their brain, for example, 
they always have calcified carotid arteries from atherosclerosis, and their vertebral arteries are always calcified too, literally almost every single one of them. Almost all of them, they'll have coronary artery disease, they'll have cataract surgery at least in one eye, routinely it's in both, they'll have poor dentition, these are all related to vascular disease in my experience. The inflammation theories of Alzheimer's, you know, they've, they've been largely refuted. Don't get me wrong, I think brain inflammation contributes, but it's not the main cause. So that's, that's important. You want to know what begins it all, okay? Hypoxia begins it all. What causes hypoxia? High dietary fat, for example, causing the blood to be thick. You can't deliver oxygen as well. High dietary sodium because it vasoconstricts arteries, uh, so you can't deliver oxygen well. Smoking cigarettes and nicotine, vasoconstrictor, drops oxygen delivery to the tissue. Smoking also has carbon monoxide, drops oxygen supply to the tissue. And then we're going to get into a little, another concept here. So I'm going to give you like a, a couple concepts. Number one, you need good oxygen delivery to tissues, which means you want to minimize dietary fat and you want to minimize dietary sodium. Uh, number two, you want to not increase the metabolic rate of the cell for no reason. So that's why you don't want caffeine or MSG because they or excessive stress because they all increase glutamate neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter, and then they cause unnecessary increased activity in that postsynaptic cell. In order to function and stay alive, that cell has to make a lot more ATP to just go through that busy work, so to speak, of unnecessary uh, metabolic activity. So a neuron will die if it doesn't get enough oxygen and glucose. So what I'm saying is you don't want to increase the demand for oxygen and glucose for no reason through unnecessary things like caffeine. You don't need caffeine. All right. And then you want to avoid toxins because these toxins, like we talked about the vegetable oils having hydroxy non and all in the previous lectures recently, they're going to damage the ability of that cell to produce energy, to produce ATP. So you see where this is going? You want them to be even, blood delivery with oxygen and glucose and metabolic demand. If you ramp up metabolic demand, you have to ramp up blood supply or that neuron is at risk to die from apoptosis, programmed cell death due to it can't meet its energy needs. Also, if you further lower um, the cell's ability to produce energy because of things like aluminum, hydroxy non and all that stuff, you're creating a bigger difference between the energy delivery in the form of oxygen and glucose relative to the metabolic demand, making the cells more likely to die. Okay, I mean, you just look at a regular brain. Brain's 2% of your body weight, but it uses 20 to 25% of the body's oxygen and glucose. So let's say the brain weighs up in the ballpark of three pounds and 150 pound person. And then you've got, you can also look at a PET scan. Look at a fluoro dioxy glucose PET scan, and you'll see the brain lights up like it's on fire. The only thing in the ballpark of that is the left ventricle. The brain uses tons of glucose, okay? It wants glucose in a big way. In a separate lecture in the future, I'll go through the metabolic reactions in the brain, why it is that it wants to burn glucose. It does not want to burn fat through beta oxidation. I know ketone bodies are a special situation in starvation conditions, but it's just a key point. Under normal conditions, the brain wants glucose. Okay, a couple of things about causes of cognitive impairment. And by the way, these are not in the textbooks. Don't think you can learn stuff from a medical textbook, okay? Uh, quite frankly, medical textbooks read by medical students are a joke, okay? They're not going to cure you. Let's briefly, we can briefly talk a little bit about disease theory, but, you know, look about, if you go to autoimmune disease, you, you look at the standard textbook. It'll be this thick, the textbook. And believe me, I've gone through a bunch of them, all right? There'll be nothing about leaky gut in the entire chapter on autoimmune disease. That's ridiculous. It's thought to be the most common cause. You go to the chapter on hypertension, there'll be, it'll just say, the cause of hypertension is unknown in about 95%. That's why it's called essential hypertension. That's nonsense. You know that there's zero hypertension in plant-based saltless communities. Zero. That's worth knowing. It's not in any of these books. And all these pioneers that we talk about that have, you know, improved the results in hypertensive patients like Dr. Kempner, for example, with Nathan Pritikin, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, etc., Dr. Ornish. They're not even in any of these books. They're not even mentioned. <laughs> That's what I'm saying is you cannot learn these things from the big medical textbook. I went to the big neurology textbooks to see if they were in there. There'd be like a little paragraph on excitotoxicity under the context of stroke or under the context of epilepsy. That's a joke, just so you know. That's an absolute joke. The entire textbook should be about a third devoted to the subject, okay? That's what really causes people to lose brain cells. 
these concepts here about vascular disease and atherosclerosis. So that's partly why I'm making these lectures so that, you know, intelligent, motivated people can learn how stuff works. And you can double check everything I say. If you go into the scientific literature, you'll see it all confirmed. But it's hard to get this all put together, you know. Um, I've kind of been studying all these years. It's kind of fun for me. I can see all the connections between the main fields and so I can put it all together. And, you know, so I think, hope it'll help people. All right, so what else? Hypertension, you're screwed either way. If your pressure goes too high, you're at risk to bleed. If your pressure goes too low, you're at risk to have a loss of brain cells like we talked about for these reasons. So what would I do if I had hypertension? I would optimize my diet till it was perfect, get my exercise, etc. And almost everybody who does that ends up not needing meds. There are rare exceptions, yes. Um, and it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It can take a while. Sometimes it can take months. But it does almost always happen if you read about management of hypertension. The danger of taking a pill is you run the risk of overtreating it eventually too. So that's a separate topic of giving previous lectures on that, but it's kind of a big deal in the sense that if your pressure's too high, you're bleeding your brain, you're at risk. I see cerebral microbleeds every day. You don't get a big bleed that often, but you get little microbleeds quite often with hypertension. And if you undertreat it, you don't get enough blood supply to your brain. Diabetes causes a lot of microvascular disease. We talked about that before. Sleep apnea, we talked about that. Pickwick syndrome is just being fat because your fat belly is harder to lower the diaphragm and get a good breath. Um, complex topics, we're not going to go into those now, but I'm just making the point there's a lot of things that contribute to cognitive decline, metabolic slow poisons that decrease your ability to produce oxygen, things like arsenic, F-, uh, cadmium, lead, mercury, GP, h &E, all these stuff, and there's other ones too. Traumatic brain injury, this is a little bit interesting. I'll talk more about this in the future, but traumatic brain injury decreases pyruvate dehydrogenase. That's the enzyme that connects uh, glycolysis to Krebs cycle. And you need that to get those two carbon units of acetyl-CoA into the mitochondrial matrix to function for Krebs cycle, which produces the uh, reduced electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, to run electron transport for making ATP. So what I'm basically saying is, when a person's brain has been traumatized, like let's say they had a concussion playing football or soccer or some other sport, they need to take a prolonged rest. All the stuff about come back in a week or two, I think that's a big mistake because it takes time for those, those neurons to restore their function and be able to produce adequate amounts of energy. So remember, you want to match blood supply to metabolic rate in that neuron. So if you have a neuron that can't make much energy, you it cannot handle a high metabolic demand imposed upon it. Okay, so that's an important point. Traumatic brain injury decreases pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme, lowering energy production. Therefore, after traumatic brain injury, a person needs some prolonged rest to let those neurons heal. Because the brain heals, but it just heals slowly. Vasoconstrictors, we talked about them, like sodium is the big one. But, you know, a lack of potassium, a lack of magnesium, they both come from plants. Those also will lead to more vasoconstriction. Nicotine in cigarettes is a vasoconstrictor. Excitotoxins, these are things that overstimulate the postsynaptic neurons. So let's say you got two neurons here. This is the postsynaptic one, this is the pre. Okay, it releases a neurotransmitter, it goes across, and then it activates the postsynaptic neuron. And um, things that overstimulate the postsynaptic neuron, like caffeine causes the release of increased glutamate. Monosodium glutamate is thought to mimic the effect of glutamate. It's a little more complex than that. Aspartame is thought to mimic the effect of aspartate. Um, GP is also, it's a long story, but it's related to glycine and it's thought to increase excitotoxic effect. And there's a lot more to that subject, but that's the general idea. Miscellaneous brain toxins. Alcohol is like directly toxic to the brain. You make toxic aldehydes. That's a topic for a separate day. I've got a previous lecture on that, plus there's more to alcohol. It's really bad for the brain. I recommend zero alcohol, none, not one sip. Okay, MJ, everybody hears all the stuff about MJ that it's not a big deal. I think it is a very big deal, and I would recommend never go near this stuff. In my experience, people that mess around with that, they don't do well. Okay, lack of vitamin B12, air pollution, some of these chemicals like toluene. You know, if you're ever in a place where things smell bad, trust your nose. Get away from that spot. At the very least, ventilate the area, okay? Hypothyroidism, a lot of things cause that. You know, leaky gut and Hashimoto's, Graves. Uh, and there's other things that cause it as well. They all are thought to decrease cognitive function. Uh, miscellaneous, we talked about, a, a, so a lack of learning, ongoing learning, education, reading, studying, intelligent conversations leads to a lack of cognitive reserve. Um, 
How much does uh, herpes simplex virus play in there? Some of the cold sore getting activated episodes. Does that cause cognitive decline? They say it does. I'm not so sure it does, but it, it's relatively mild. I've never once seen a history of that being thought related. Never once has a neurologist ever asked me about that, but I, I come across it in my reading. MPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus, also called communicating hydrocephalus, pretty rare. Sometimes it does happen, and the patients sometimes do get better with a ventricular peritoneal shunt put into their brain, but it's quite rare that it's thought to actually be causing their symptoms, and they actually get shunted, and they actually get better. That actually is a rare event. I mean, it can happen. I've seen it happen, but it's uncommon. I would say that in my experience, that's even though some places that want to do the procedures and are paid to do them will tell you it's a lot of dementia, 5% or something. In my experience, it's far less than 1%. Uh, big meningioma, pushing down the frontal lobes. I see that once every 15 years. I mean, that's rare. can happen. I have seen it, but it's a total zebra. Um, when I say zebras, and the medical metaphor is when you hear hoof beats, think of horses. Things that are rare are called zebras. Things that are super, super rare are called the copies. Okay. You know, that animal that looks like a half giraffe, half zebra. Okay. Depression can give you a pseudo dementia. Excessive being sedentary, you're going to get less lymphatic flow. It's associated with increased atherosclerosis, decreased neurogenesis, formation of new neurons. Okay. And then we kind of went through this the mouse equivalent. So the bottom line is. Avoid vascular disease, so you'll avoid all these problems, and you'll avoid all these mouse equivalents, and you keep your brain working optimally. Um, and understand that dementia is primarily due to a, a lack of blood supply to the brain, and um, there's a lot you can do about it to prevent it. hope that's helpful.